welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. A very warm welcome. This is uh, How I Got Here, uh, Focus Wire and Mozio's uh, weekly podcast, where we interview the innovators and leaders in travel and transportation and their startups. Uh, this week, we welcome Juan D'Antonio. He's the founder and CEO of Cabify, based in Spain, where he joins us today. Uh, the ride-sharing company was created in 2011, since gone on to expand to Portugal and throughout Latin America. It's raised around $400 million to date from the likes of uh, Rakuten Capital into American Development Bank and a number of others. So uh, again, a very warm welcome to Arne. Thank you so much for joining us on How I Got Here this week. Thank you, Gavin. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Uh, Tradition dictates, as we always say, that we ask you this very first question and we're always uh, eager to hear what people have to say. And that is, can you tell us, Juan, how you got here? Sure. Um... Uh, t- today I, I got here riding my bicycle, but I guess uh, you're referring to, to the company. So, um, <laughs> uh, well, I, it's a long story. I try to make it brief. Um, I, I love the mountains. I love the nature. And at some point in time in my career, I decided I, I wanted to work in something that was relevant for me. And, and, and there was, uh, I wanted more trees in cities and, and less uh vehicles polluting the environment. Um, so I was working in, in the electric vehicle industry trying to convince people that they should change their combustion engines for electric vehicles. This was back in 2010. People didn't seem very eager to pay a bit more for a vehicle with a lower top speed, lower range. I remember this was back in 2010. Uh, so uh, maybe they, they would be more inclined to subscribe or to pay for a, a service where they didn't have to buy an asset and just use it. And uh, we thought that, uh, yeah, it would be easier to replace a fleet of vehicles that is shared as opposed to replacing uh, a whole, uh, I mean, all the private vehicles. No? So we created Cabify with the idea of uh, sharing vehicles and being able to use uh, vehicles that would be uh, were better suited uh, for the environment. Um, and, and that was the, the idea back in 2011, but of course many things happened along the way. As you can imagine, we were close to, we, we, we lived several near-death experiences, uh, survived through difficult times. And uh, yeah, now we are, we are uh, living a, a moment, a critical moment again, because uh, through the pandemic, uh, we've seen an increased use of uh, private vehicles uh, a decreased use of collective means of transportation. So it's, um, I mean, we, we, we are eager uh, to see what happens on the next decade and to try to, to make a, an impact here. Thanks for joining us, Juan. So I would love to hear kind of what your overarching strategy is because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of trendy terms being bandied about in the, um, in the mobility world, mobility as a service, mass is a big one, um, you know, ride share, um, you know, and carpooling. There's a, there's a lot of, you know, kind of, um, you know, ways to position yourself. Um, how would you think of yourself as a company at Cabify? Uh, we think of ourselves uh, as a substitute to private vehicles. And that, I guess, the closest of the terms that you mentioned is mobility as a service. You know, we, we started at a, as a ride hailing company. Um, you could use your phone to hail a vehicle. A vehicle could be a, a P2P, a private hire vehicle, or a, a taxi. Uh, in, in, in the future, uh, we believe people will uh, buy a package of kilometers or a package of miles and uh, decide which mode of transportation they will want to use uh, at any given point in, in, in time. No? So um, we we have uh, ride hailing options. We also have micro mobility options within our platform. We also have subscription options. For, uh, you can rent a bike for, for a month within uh, the Cabify app. Uh, you can uh, hop on on a, on a car that you drive yourself for a few minutes, uh, car sharing. Um, you can get a kick scooter, a moped. Um, so we, we started in ride hailing, but with that 
purpose of, of uh, providing you a true alternative to, to private vehicle ownership, we are providing you with several categories. Of course, this is easier said than done. We've uh, made a lot of mistakes along the way and, and had a lot of fun correcting them. <laughs> well, so I'm curious, you know, so you mentioned a lot of different services there. I'm curious how you think about the differences between, you know, collaborating with others versus launching your own, you know, um, cooperation uh, or cooperation versus do it yourself, right? The mobility world is incredibly fragmented. And um, how do you think about it? That is it by geography, you want to, you want to own the entire geographical stack? Is it by uh, type of transportation you want to own you're, you're fine partnering for local locals with local scooter companies but you want to own the ride share um, how, how, what does that strategy look like yeah that, that strategy changes on a country per country basis there are countries where we have a, a really strong uh, presence in, in ride hailing and we have the bandwidth to uh, deliver other services ourselves and then there are other countries where we are less mature where we've been for uh, shorter period of time and, and we partner with uh, other uh, companies to provide those services. Uh, looking at Spain, our most mature market in Spain, uh, we, are, we even own vehicles ourselves. We are vertically integrated in the right healing space, uh, operating and, and uh, employing uh, drivers ourselves. Uh, we operate a fleet of uh, electric mopeds and electric key scooters and we also uh, own uh, bicycles that we rent on a monthly basis. We partner, however, with third parties uh, to, to provide you a rental car or a, or a car uh, sharing by, by the minute experience. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it varies. We adapt to the, to the uh, nature of the geography. This is an extremely local business. I would uh, even use the term, term uh, ultra local because it's not about the city. It's, it's also about the neighborhood and the density you can provide in every neighborhood. So we, we yeah, that, that's how we approach the, the problem. We adapt in each market. So you touched on something interesting. Is it's an extremely local problem. And I think this is one of the key misunderstandings of kind of the ride hill hype back when Uber was dominating a lot of the conversation. It was, well, every, Uber will eventually take over everywhere, blah, blah, blah. I know that was kind of the, the, the overarching narrative. Um, I think that most people didn't realize that there, how many local quirks there were. And I remember Taxify now Bolt, you know, surviving in Eastern Europe because uh, Uber didn't want to deal with local taxis and local regulation. It sounds like part of your moat and part of your strategy has been to dive deep into, into your local regions and just kind of focus on those regions. You guys are only in, am I correct, Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries? Is, is, is that correct? Yes. I mean, we are focused in Latin America and Iberia, although, I mean, it doesn't have it's not related to the to the language. It's yep. it's mostly around which markets we saw uh, were a good fit for the product we were offering. In Latin, we started in Spain, and when we thought about expansion, we realized that in Latin America, people uh, didn't have a, an alter, didn't have a proper alternative to to vehicle uh, private vehicle ownership. You know? uh, the subways, the the the, the collective means of transportation were not as developed as they, they are maybe in, in Europe. So we, we thought that that was, or we realized that was a, a huge market opportunity. And, and the way we approach the problem, how we differentiate it was, uh, well, thinking long-term. We always uh, believed that there, this was going to be a transformation that was going to require a number of years. It was going to happen overnight. And, uh, and we, we, we thought, uh, the, this whatever we provided had to be sustainable, meaning that uh, the, the price point, for instance, uh, how we set prices, uh, everyone had to win in that structure. We we couldn't rely or we shouldn't rely on subsidies on uh, unsustainable uh, pricing structures to to create a, a market. The, the the driver had to make money. The passenger uh, had to find a, a price point that they were willing to to pay. Um, and uh, well, that, that uh, we, we, we tried to, to think uh, long term from, from the beginning, uh, which had implications um, mostly around pricing. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm interested. So many of the startup founders that we have interviewed on how I got here are part of co founding teams. You created Cabify on your own, but then brought in co founders. Talk us through that kind of process because. 
in some respects, that's quite unusual. The co-founders are there from the very beginning as a, like a team, but you brought yours in afterwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, when we started the company, uh, we were doing zero revenues and uh, today we are much bigger. So you could actually make a point that everyone who joined the company I mean, two years ago, uh, when it was you know, one third of, of the size it has now, to some extent, uh, they were also uh, co-founders. No? Uh, within the startup community, th there are many, um, a lot of romanticism around issues that maybe are not that relevant. I don't think uh, who, whoever started the company is, is the, the most, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not relevant. The, the relevant part is who drove the company to, to, to find product market fit, who was there to push through the hard times and and get the company where it, it needs to to be, you know? And uh, other, I mean, so the, the whole founder term, I, I believe there is a lot of uh, undeserved credit for that. I'm, I'm more of a fan of of uh, teams and, and managers and leaders and CEOs, if, if you will, rather than than founders. And then there are many other issues that where we pay a lot of attention, such as the size of the round, the valuation, all of these things are temporary uh, uh, features that don't speak to the, to the value of this that you're creating or to the success of the company. You know? we, we tend to think success is, uh, I don't know, achieving the or, or closing a big round. I mean, for us, success is working in something that is important to us and uh, enjoying, wanting to continue working in, in that thing. As, uh, if, uh, People in the startups are, are, I mean, are listening to this this podcast. They they know how how hard it is to um, to drive a company forward. How much energy you can drain. What uh, how hard the roller coaster is. So uh, wanted to still be there, uh, being passionate about what you do is a, a true success in our, in our view. I, I, it maybe maybe you will be offended by this question, but I'm curious because did you get annoyed? in the early days with comparisons with Uber, because around the same time Uber was doing its big expansion strategy into Europe out of the US and was getting so much press coverage in a lot of the kind of the tech, the tech media and in the mainstream media. Did you find any comparisons to be helpful or were you just annoyed if you got those comparisons? There, there are benefits when uh, you belong to a category and there are uh, disadvantages, of course. Uh, it's helpful that people know what you do and understand it easily. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you might get uh, punished for the sins of, of others, no? uh, meaning that they believe you might commit the same mistakes. Uh, in our industry, uh, yeah, there, there was a name that was uh, very well known, but they didn't invent uh, the industry. There were other players uh, uh, before that. Actually, the P2P business, which uh, is what everyone uh, now sees as a, as a right hailing industry, was really invented by companies like Sidecar or, or, or Lyft. No? Uh, but uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, we, we focus on who is bigger and, and uh, yeah. So in any case, it's um, it, it was helpful for the category, but uh, some of the practices that they uh, they used uh, were not very helpful to, to be associated with. Uh, we, we took a very different approach to the market. Uh, again, mentioning that we, we, we were looking at, at building a sustainable industry, uh, we we really f uh, had to st strengthen the points of differentiation which, and uh, well, uh, had to leverage also the, the advantages of, of belonging to a known category. Yeah. And did you find in those first few years, one that you were able to capture the attention of investors because of the general growth of the market? I mean, were it, was it easy to get the doors to investors open to have those conversations? So actually, um, I mean, there were very aggressive tactics back then in, in the market. Uh, uh, typically, I mean, and this is public, some people were, in, in order to see or have access to uh, 
invest in some of these companies. They, they had to um, sign some sort of uh, document where they, they would commit not to invest in other companies. They were also very uh, similar aggressive tactics being used with, with lawyers. I remember <laughs> as I was uh, about to close our series, uh, probably C, when Rakuten uh, was going to write our first big check, over $100 million, I received a, a call from uh, the, the lawyer we had back then telling me that uh, he had to stop representing us if, if he wanted to have a chance to uh, ever represent uh, uh, other clients in the, in the industry. No? Uh, and imagine, you know, I, I was in, in Tokyo closing that deal as I... I lived the, in the law firm I was working for uh, five or six years already and decided to, to stop working just to have a chance to, to work with another, another company. Uh, similar things happened with uh, investment banks for a while. So yeah, it, it, was, let's say, it, it was a fun ride for her. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned, well, you know, I think government is actually an interesting thing to actually touch on here. Um, so you guys pulled out of parts of Catalonia at one point. I'm actually not sure if you, you came back in, you know, LATAM has the occasional taxi protests and I think I don't go a, a month without seeing some article about someone burning a taxi or, or a, a Uber in protest in Barcelona. Um, and so I think there's, you know, there's an interesting government ecosystem that you kind of have to operate within and um you said competitor you allude to but never name <laughs> he who must not be named he is uh is, is notable for having an ask for forgiveness not permission uh attitude how have you guys uh you know navigated uh that yourself um we took a very different approach um and very collaborative approach with uh existing i mean with, with communities in general uh First, with drivers, we, we care about uh, our drivers. We, as, as I mentioned in Spain, for instance, they are fully uh, employed. Uh, also with the cities where we operate, we, within our principles, we, we have one where we say that the, the city is our customer. No? So we need to do what is right for, for our cities. And, and that means that we need to work with uh, the, the regulators and, and respect the laws, uh, of course, Fiscal laws, uh, tax laws. I know this is a big, um, this is a big uh, issue around technology companies. Why are uh, technology companies avoiding paying taxes in the countries where they operate? That's uh, I, I don't see an explanation for that. I mean, if you truly want to, to build value and, and improve uh, the the communities where you operate, maybe yeah, you have to uh, follow certain basic principles, no? Um, so, I mean, following this uh, long-term view, and uh, we, we always uh, work closely with regulators, we ask them what we could and what we couldn't do, and we were respectful of that. Of course, uh, sometimes that didn't play to our advantage because uh, we respected the rules and others maybe didn't, and, uh, and well, the rules were changing and, and we had to, to adapt. In, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Catalonia, it's funny because um, at some point we were in, in some, some media blamed us for charging 10x uh, the, the normal rate of, of a journey in New York and we've never operated in, in New York. So this is what, what I mean by being punished for, for uh, sins that other, other come in. But, but now I, I wanted to make a, a clarification because I mean, we are the only one, uh, we don't have uh, Uber operating in, in Barcelona. So if, if you see images of things happening in, in Catalonia, that must be a Cabify. <laughs> um, well, um, well, so I mean, I think you touched on something interesting is sometimes the rules were changing and sometimes the, um, you know, uh, Uber was not playing by the rules. So I think this is always an interesting thing and, in, 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 you know, capitalism in general is like, how do you deal with, keeping principles in a market with unscrupulous actors. And even, you know, like, I'm curious if, how do, how do you make it make business sense to, to pay your drivers a, you know, a higher wage, let's say, when theoretically Uber can lower it, you know, just get more users on the platform and try to kill you with, with you know, uh, with their subsidies, right? Um, I, I, 
it, like, let me put this way. I, I believe in it. Don't get me wrong. So this isn't meant to be, you know, challenging you too aggressively here, but I kind of want to suss Yeah, I want to suss out exactly like how, how do you actually do that? Because it sounds nice on paper um, and you clearly have succeeded, right? As have a few other players. Um, but Juno said something similar in New York City, right? About like, you know, kind of uh, really having a driver first platform uh, ended up kind of failing. So we would love to hear how, how you actually make that happen. Of course, the, the easiest path is if there is a level playing field where the laws are, are the same for everyone and everyone follows them. So that would be the ideal scenario. Um, how, we, how we work uh, through these challenges is uh, well, using technology and using data to focus on solving that specific problem. So what are you solving for? Are you solving for growth? Are you solving for exponential growth and not caring about anything else? then you'll probably follow certain steps. In our case, we were following, uh, we were solving for building a sustainable uh, community. And that meant that maybe we wouldn't be able to grow 1000% month over month because it would be impossible to balance supply and demand at those growth rates. But that uh, we could maybe grow 30% uh, month over month over uh, many years and, uh, and focus on solving the, the problem of balancing supply and demand and uh, achieving a uh, cost per working hour, as we call it, as the KPI we, we use, uh, that allows drivers to, to get uh, well, a, 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 an income that uh, ensures um, they can pay their car, they can also pay their, their other costs. No? Uh, so it's about the, the problem you focus on. Uh, um, and, and what you are trying to, to optimize for. And, and again, that, that, that was a, a key uh, number for us. Let me ask you, you, you mentioned Rakuten, one of your investors. They also invested in Lyft. How does that kind of, yeah. I'm interested in the kind of conversations that come about when something like that emerges. I mean, when you were talking to Lyft about, uh, when you were talking to Rakuten about them investing in you, I mean, did they, what is, the, what is their kind of, strategy that they tell you we're going to invest in you oh and we're also going to invest in lyft which you might well compete with in certain markets no, no, uh, Rakuten has been a truly uh, supportive uh, investor they've uh, I mean, we were we would be nowhere close to where we are without uh, their help uh, they they've been and they are extremely supportive they decide they saw this industry uh, potential earlier than uh, many other investors and also realized that this uh, was not a natural monopoly. Uh, they realized that being, uh, having that multi-local feature or ultra-local feature, sorry, uh, there was uh, a certain size beyond which you wouldn't get strong network effects or, or strong additional benefits uh, from, from a scale. Um, imagine if, if you live in, a, in, in your neighborhood, there is no difference if a network has 1,000 vehicles or 5,000 vehicles, the estimated time of arrival is approximately the same. So yeah. uh, this is a natural oligopoly rather than uh, a natural monopoly. So it, they realized that and they decided to make a bet in, in teams that uh, were unique and had a, an ability to execute. And of course, we've always had conversations with uh, other companies they've uh, supported. Uh, I respect a lot the, the team at, at Lyft and uh, there have been times where we've uh, uh, tried to discuss a specific problems that we were facing and, and our teams have uh, to have an investor that uh, had invested in, in different companies within the same industry, of course in different geographies, <laughs> I guess it would have been a different story uh, and, and there are examples in the industry, I guess. Uh, uh, SoftBank invested in, in Uber and, and Didi, and uh, they've been mm -hmm. competing in, in some markets. So I, I, I cannot speak about how that uh, works out. In our case, the relationship with Rakuten worked out very well. <laughs> you said at the beginning that there had been, um, you'd used two phrases. You said you've made lots of mistakes, and you also said there's been some near-death experiences. I wonder if you could... Um, talk us through some of the slightly more negative stories around yeah. the, the evolution of Cabify. Sure, M most of these uh, near-death experiences were concentrated in the early history of, of the company, fortunately for, uh, for us. Uh, but, you know, things uh, sometimes don't, don't work out as, as you plan them, only sometimes. 
Um, I remember when we uh, launched the, the technology, launched the service, launched the app, and we said, hey, we made it. It's on the marketplace. Now let's wait for customers to come. <laughs> and there we sat waiting and no customer came by himself. We had to go to find them. And uh, so it took us a while to, to find the right customers. How did um, you f- sorry to interrupt. How did the, you find the, Sorry to interrupt, Juan. How did you find the customers when they didn't come to you? No, no problem. The, at, at the, I mean, we, we did all, all sorts of, I mean, we went to the streets, literally. Like we would be at the Atocha train <laughs> station in Madrid where the high speed train comes handing out the voucher. So actually went to the streets to get the customers. The, the way the, the regulation works in, in Madrid rest, ha, meant a lot of restrictions into which vehicles could operate. And when we launched back in 2011, there were only 600 vehicles we could work uh, with in, in Madrid. And most of them were like Mercedes E-Class. So uh, there was a shortage of, of supply uh, and that, that meant it was really challenging to scale, but also very challenging to actually automate the, the right hailing experience because I mean, we've developed this uh, wonderful technology that allowed you to, to get into a car and, and get out and pay with your credit card without uh, any human interaction. But the reality was that drivers uh, back then, 2011, they didn't love a smartphone. Some of them didn't have a smartphone. Most of them didn't have a smartphone. And uh, I remember we, we had a team we called Excellence with Paco, one of the co-founders uh, leading it. Basically at that time, Paco was the team. Uh, and uh, whenever a customer was requesting a journey, he would see it on the system that it was being directed to a closest driver, but the closest driver wouldn't pick up uh, the, the request. So you will find Paco quite often calling the customer and say, saying, hey, we are getting your vehicle, hold on, don't worry. And then calling the driver and say, why are you not picking up? Uh, please pick up the request. And uh, this is a, a very important customer. Go and take good care of him. Um, so yeah, it was, it was challenging to attract customers. It, uh, technology wasn't, uh, even though we solved the technology part, there was a human component. Uh, it required some time to, to solve. And uh, we were burning more cash than what we had anticipated. You, you mentioned the amount of cash I mean, approximately we, we've raised, but back then uh, we were raising uh, 100, 200K a month and we were burning approximately the same amount. Uh, in two, we, we didn't close our Series A until 2014, almost three years after we, we had launched. And we were already operating in, in four countries, in Spain, Mexico, Peru, and Chile. In, in four big cities. Uh, in total, we probably had raised $2 million, uh, which of course we were burning every month over the, that period of, of, of three years. So uh, sometimes we just run out of cash. And uh, yeah, I, I, of course I didn't have a salary for, uh, for a long period of time. And even when I had a salary, I had to stop taking that salary because we were running out of cash. Um, at one point in time, people uh, dec- uh, decided they wanted to reduce their salaries and get more stock, um, all, all sorts of things, as, as you can imagine. We, ma- we made big mistakes because we didn't realize how expensive it, it was to launch these, these cities. And we, we had this presence in, in four cities and no cash to, to support our position. So it, was, it wasn't until in February 2014, Seaya Ventures, a Spanish uh, DC, uh, uh, funded our Series A that we were able to actually uh, plan for the, for the midterm and, and execute well. I'd like to move on to um, more upbeat things in a moment, but uh, I, I think it's, it's useful to ask you because there are a number of stories that I've read with regards to uh, the death of uh, a passenger in, I believe it was um, in uh, Mexico. And without going into the details of that and, and some of the, you know, the, there was a panic buttons were installed afterwards. What I'm curious in particular about one is how do you as the leader of a company take the organization through a period like that when something so devastating to, you know, the family of that girl and perhaps the potential brand damage? I mean, how, how do you lead a company through that? We operate in markets with a high level of violence. Um, one of the 
one of the main attributes we've built during these years is, is safety. It's one of our biggest differentiators versus other brands. Um, if, if we build for the long term, uh, you need to ensure uh, yeah, you, you provide additional attributes beyond uh, price and, and time of arrival. And, and we focused on safety, we focused on, um, on quality, we focused on uh, sustainability. No? Uh, this said, and when you do millions of, of journeys and you operate in, in a country uh, with uh, that degree of, uh, of violence, at some point you're going to encounter a, a challenge. And uh, uh, it's not enough to be 99.99999% safe. You, you want to, to be 100% safe because you're talking about people, you're talking about lives. Um, in this, I, I guess you're referring to, the, uh, to Mara, uh, uh, who was uh, assassinated in, in, in Puebla, in Mexico. Uh, right. It was terrible. It was terrible for, for everyone, starting, of course, uh, for her family and relatives. And the company uh, uh, did everything uh, we could to, to, to try to clarify what happened. And, of course, uh, introduce additional safety measures after that uh, death. But uh, even though it, it was uh, tragic, uh, maybe that wasn't, uh, I mean, the, the, the biggest challenge in our industry it's around safety for, for drivers. Um, maybe media picks up, picks up more stories about, about passengers because we feel closer to, to passengers, but uh, where we've put, uh, where we have to put a lot of effort as well is, is on, on the safety of, of drivers. Uh, so yeah, it was tragic. Uh, we, we were, reinforced in our um, in our belief that what we were doing was helpful because um, I mean that was the, the first and the first case and, and, and the only case and we recognized that maybe there would be other cases but that if we put if we continue developing technology to uh, to increase safety uh, the and, and the alternative I mean we would be in a much better position than the alternative that uh, our technology is providing safety for uh, people that uh, would have been able to uh, to get through without it uh, before no so it, it is very difficult certainly very difficult it wore down some some people because uh, as I mentioned this this is this was and this is still is our biggest attribute so it was very um, surprising that something like that happened. No? The first thing we had to do was to acknowledge that uh, yeah, with volume, you will always find uh, these tragic things if, if you operate in countries uh, like this. So I uh, wanted to quickly follow up on that. Um, I remember I landed in Cancun, you know, a few years ago and noticed that you guys didn't serve Cancun and I just checked your website and I don't think you still do unless I'm, I'm mistaken. But um, I remember I asked around and asked why Uber and no one else seemed to um, do anything in Cancun and someone told me, and I don't really know if this is uh, true or not, if it's could be, as I say, you know, I'm aware that it sounds like maybe something they tell Americans to scare them, um, but uh, that potentially um, it was because the cartels owned a lot of taxi companies in, uh, in Cancun and no one really wanted to mess with that. And one, I don't know if that's true. We'd love to understand if it is, but um, I think it begs the question is like, where's the line, right? Like clearly um, there's a line where you go, okay, this, we're just not even going to operate in this market. Um, it's dangerous, but there's a level of danger that like, we don't want to um, get involved in. How do you draw that line and why not Cancun? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, um, the, the most surprising part is that uh, maybe the places where our drivers have suffered more violence are not the ones where you would expect. We operate in countries that uh, have high uh, intensity of violence. Think of Mexico, think of uh, Brazil, uh, Peru, Colombia, uh, well, compared to, to Spain. Um, you would expect them to be much more violent. No? And still, uh, when there were protests against uh, our business model, uh, we 
saw more of our more of our vehicles being burned in in Spain than in any other market. So it, it's difficult to forecast uh, how violence is gonna uh, affect uh, your drivers, your passengers, etc. You 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 can recognize you are operating in a in a challenging market, uh, but you cannot forecast what's uh, gonna happen. All you can do is uh, well to to put your best effort. So uh, the net effect of you operating there is uh, it's significantly positive. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, we, we've experienced different levels of violence in, in our markets. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, the situation now is, uh, is very different. No? We, uh, cooperate with uh, taxis in all of our markets. In fact, back in 2017, we acquired the, the biggest taxi uh, hailing company in Latin America. Um, but the transitions are never easy. So um, yeah, we had to endure <laughs> difficult times uh, with, uh, with all of this. Well, well. Um, I hope uh, hope we go get get you in Cancun sometime soon. Then, <laughs> um, well, I think that's all we've we uh, time we have today. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Juan. Um, you know, this this has been how I got here, Mozio and Focus Wires weekly podcast about the innovators in travel and transportation. And we uh, release this weekly every Thursday, distributed on Focus Wire's newsletter. You can follow us on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, whatever uh, podcast platform of your choice. And thanks again, Juan. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Great to be here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for listening to How I Got Here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.